Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope you're having a great day. So, I have to tell you, you know, I <laughs> I have the worst memory. I get these stories and if I don't pretty much read them right away, I basically look at them a month down the road and can't remember whether I read them or not. So occasionally I'll have to reach out to the writer and ask, do you remember if I did this? Do you remember what episode it was? I'm not kidding. I ugh, Worst memory. But it's not just me. I've noticed other narrators doing this as well, saying, oh, oh I think I read that. So anyways, this is one of those stories. I've had it since March. And I have reached out to the writer several times and they haven't gotten back to me. So I'm just going to throw all caution to the wind and I'm going to read it. Hopefully it's for the first time, but if you guys have heard it before, please forgive me. Okay, so he just has it titled uh, Bigfoot Stories. Hello there, I've been a fan of yours for quite some time now, so I've decided to send you some real life stories that have happened to my family and myself. I chose to send them to you because I feel like you have created a forum where we can talk at ease with one another, something like sitting around a kitchen table or a campfire telling each other our stories. I truly love the way he described that. That is really cool and that is the whole point of why I do what I do. Okay. So, then he goes on to say, My family has experienced everything from ghosts, Sasquatch, shadow people, aliens, etc. I don't know if it's because we have Celtic blood in us that has made us so sensitive to these things. My sister says that so many things have happened to us that when there's another experience, we mention it and then it's forgotten. So with me, things seem to have started when I was around four years old. My parents owned a camp on a lake in northern Ontario. Now, the only way in was by boats, so one day my mother and I were out picking hazelnuts when I found what I could only describe as a doll made of sticks. I ran to my mother to show her, and she asked me where I'd found it. I told her, as it was only in the next clump of bush, she told me to go put it back. Being a kid, I didn't want to, but she made me do it, saying that whoever lost it would be back to get it. So, reluctantly, I returned it. We never did go back to that camp. First thing I knew, my father had sold it. I don't know the name of the lake. My mom has since passed away, and I can't remember. My dad is 92 and suffers from dementia, and that doesn't help. One time I was visiting my sister up in Timmins and her husband, at the time, decided to bring his eldest son hunting. I was asked to join them, so I did, even though I had no rifle with me. It was a beautiful sunny day, so I thought it would be nice. We drove out on the highway and then on the road and then a logging road and finally a dirt one. We got out of the car, but instead of being a happy demeanor, I felt something was wrong. I felt like we were being observed. We walked for a while and then fog set in. It wasn't a heavy fog, but one where you could only see about 50 feet or so. We came across a structure made of branches where the bigger parts were staked on each other similar to a log house, but it was only on one corner. My brother-in-law mentioned that someone had built a shelter, but I noticed that no fire had been lit. We walked a bit further down this dirt road when we started to hear wood knocking. My brother-in-law said someone was chopping down trees. I told him if someone was cutting trees, they could use a chainsaw, not an axe. I then felt dread. 
It's the only word that I can use to describe my feelings. Here we are, way out in the middle of nowhere, and no one knew where we were. My nephew was about four or five at the time, and my only thought was to protect him. Now, I'm an excellent shot. Not bragging, but I never miss when I aim. But we only had a twenty-two with us, and I wasn't carrying it. I said we needed to leave. My brother-in-law said he wanted to walk a bit further towards the people chopping wood, and maybe we could catch something. I told him to listen, so he did. I said, there's nothing around here. No noise of any animals could be heard, and we hadn't seen any tracks of them on the road. So he reluctantly decided to leave. We walked to the vehicle and turned around. I felt like we were being watched all the time. And as he drove us out of the woods, I kept looking back. It was only 15 minutes before I finally started to relax. Well, I'll stop now. As I mentioned earlier, I have lots of stories to pass on. I'll send some more if you want to hear them. Some are as long, but most are shorter. Take care, Norman Ross. Well, that was a great story. Um, I appreciate it, Norman. And of course, as I mentioned when I emailed you back, absolutely send in your stories. We would love to hear them. Okay, that was just a short story, so I'm just going to try to fit in another one. Okay, this one is titled Boyhood Encounter. My name is Matt, and this is what happened to me. I grew up in the Ozarks in southwest Missouri. This happened in 1980. I lived in a subdivision that was surrounded by woods. The road my house was on had five houses on it and a dead end. We were the only people living on this road at the time. All the other houses were empty. The moon was full that night. I rolled over in my bed and a giant figure came up to the window. My mom had put up curtains, but you could still see through them because the material was very thin. The top of its head was at the top of my window, and its shoulders were very wide. I could see that it was covered in hair. I couldn't see its face very well because the moon was casting its face in a shadow. I could hear it breathing very deeply. I was froze from terror. It swayed slightly. I was afraid it was going to reach in and get me. My parents were in the other room watching TV, and I couldn't even scream. It eventually took a step back and turned and walked away. I know it wasn't a bear. I know it wasn't a person playing a joke because my dad was law enforcement and no one ever drove down to the end of that road. The next day, I told my sister what happened, and we went outside and there were footprints. I got a tape measure, and the footprints were 18 inches long. It had walked up to my window, then around to the side of the house, and up into the woods. The top of my window is nine feet. I wouldn't go outside at night for about six years after that alone. I had many nightmares about it getting me. I would often wake up in a cold sweat. I told my mom about it five years ago, and I asked her if she remembered when I wouldn't go outside at night. She remembered and was surprised when I told her about it. She told me that my dad believed in them. He was K-9 patrol on Strategic Air Command Base in Washington. They would come up to the fences, and they would see them and find footprints. I regret that I never told him about it. He was a very disciplined man, and I never thought he would believe me. Because I know Sasquatch exists, it's opened the possibility that anything can exist. Anything is possible. I served in the military, and nothing has frightened me as much as that encounter. I don't go into the woods. I have no desire to see another one. I feel like if I did go into the woods, they would find me. From other people's stories, it sounds like there's a lot of encounters here in the Ozarks. I enjoy your channel, and I want to thank you for giving those of us a platform to tell our encounter. 
Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate you taking the time to send in your encounter. And anytime you need to talk, I'm always here for you. Okay, guys, I think I'm going to move on to another one. Okay, this one is titled Bigfoot Ruined Our Camping Trip. Do you know how many stories I get that are titled Bigfoot Ruined Our Camping Trip? A lot. Anyways, hey, this is my Bigfoot experience. About 10 years ago, me and my brother brought our girlfriends camping. The girls got bored, so they went to bed early. They both went in my tent so they could talk. My brother Billy and I sat at the fire talking. I'd be lying if I didn't say that we did hear some strange stuff through the night. But neither of us really knew anything about Bigfoot. At one point, it smelled really bad, like really bad. Then Shelby, my girlfriend, yelled, What in the name of God are you guys smoking? Well, LOL, we had smoked an hour earlier, but we went way downwind to the campsite so we wouldn't get caught. Billy's girl had issues with it, and because it was mine, I didn't want to stir the pot of chili, you know. You know what I mean. I yelled to Shelby that it was no way on us. To be honest, my stuff stank, but not like this. So we just assumed it was other people smoking. Anyway, Billy and I was talking when I saw Billy's eyes open wide, like the size of a coffee cup. He was looking over my head, and I froze. What? I asked. His eyes were glued to something behind me. So I turned in my seat, and what was standing there should not even be alive today. The monster, and it was a monster, was standing about eight feet behind me. It had stepped out of the woods and stood there waiting to be noticed, I think. I was literally stunned for about 30 seconds, and then I stood up, knocking my chair over. Billy was paralyzed in his seat. It looked down at me and it huffed. It jutted its chin in the direction of my truck, kind of like we do when we motion with our heads. Over there? Shelby chose that moment to come out of the tent, and I hear her take a sharp breath in. I said loud enough, but also very gentle like, Okay, girls, get in the truck. I backed into Billy and kicked him in the leg to jolt him awake. Billy started to stand up, and that's when we heard a very deep growl come from behind the first monster. I had to hold Billy up because he was in terrible shock. Finally, we got to the tent. Shelby went back inside and thought she'd be safe hiding in there. I could barely keep my voice from shaking. Shelby, get Kim and get in the truck now or we're leaving without you. And yes, Shelby is the love of my life and now the mother of my child. But I would have left her there for Bigfoot food if she didn't move it and I mean now. Finally, we were all in the truck and Kim and Shelby were laying on the floor in the back. But just before I turned to leave, I took another look, and there was clearly a second one in behind the first one. Now this is what Bill and I remember. They were both about seven and a half to eight feet tall, and the first one literally looked like an eight-foot-tall orangutan. It had very long arms and a torso. The legs were short and nearly bowed. The hair was long and orangey-brown in color. And there were some mats, but for the most part, it looked clean. The second one was seen, but it was standing behind the first one, so we didn't get a good look at it. Oh, and just as we were getting into the truck, there was a very loud growl, finished off with a sharp wolf like almost like a dog sound. We never went back to get our stuff. Kim and Billy broke up and Kim moved to New Jersey to live with her dad. And as you know, Shelby and I got married. I have one more story and I'll send it to you later if you want. I'm your biggest fan, signed Jameson. Wow. Oh, I can only imagine the fear that you guys went through. I can't tell you how many times People have described 
paralysis, literally not being able to move, almost as if they are put into a trance. So maybe that was what was going on with Billy. I'm not sure. But I'm glad that you guys are all safe and have moved on to other stories. And speaking of, I would be thrilled for you to send me another story. Okay, guys, I think that's going to be it. I hope you enjoyed these three encounters. You know I love ya. Have a great night and have a great weekend. We'll see you back here in a day or two. Bye-bye for now.